Um, could I please welcome to the stage actress Nazmi Aural? Um, <laughs> YouTuber Faye Rahman. Yeah. Journalist Khadija Khan. Student activist, Staff Khalik, clinical psychologist, Savin Bapur Tari, and director of Freeborn, uh, Shabina Rahman. This will be chaired by our own Mariam Namazi. Well, um, this was a very emotional film. Um, I'm glad I'm not sobbing, because usually when I watch it, I'm sobbing and I can't breathe. So it's good, at least. Uh, I, so I recommend you watch it a few times so you can uh, also grasp the importance of it, I think. It's, it's a wonderful film. We're so honored, um, Shabana and ourselves, to be able to bring this film here to you in, uh, in London. Uh, we, we'd like everyone to see it. We think it's really, really important. Uh, so it's going to be quite an informal panel discussion. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions from uh, our wonderful panelists. And then also, hopefully, they can have a conversation as well amongst themselves. And then we will for sure open it up to you uh, halfway through. So there'll be plenty of time for you to talk about your own experiences if you want, anything, um, anything that you'd like to talk about. Uh, this is being filmed, so you could also, if you don't want to be filmed, but you have a question or a comment, you could write it and give it to me, but write big because I can't see anymore. So I can't read, read anything anymore without reading glasses, but I refuse to wear them. Um, so I just want to see what time it is. Okay. Um, so I, I guess we have to start with the most brilliant Nazmi Oral, um, because seriously, I think this is such a touching film. Um, and I think it's such an important film for all of us because it does talk a lot to the experiences of anyone who's uh, decided to be different and to live the life of their choosing. And I think there's a lot of people, maybe everyone in this room has some idea about that. Um, so I'd like to start with you. I mean, I, I think uh, it's such a brave thing to have this conversation with your family. I'm not sure many of us have had these conversations. Sometimes it seems even more difficult than actually not mentioning it and not discussing it. So why did you feel the need to do something so difficult? Because I, I guess you could have taken an easier route um, and not have had these very difficult conversations. So why did you do that? Uh, I couldn't have taken an easier route <laughs> because uh, this is actually the way I deal with everything in my life. I, uh, I make work out of it and I do that with my brilliant, uh, actually soulmate sister, Adelaide Rosa. And um, so yeah, when, when um, uh, like five years ago I was uh, having a conversation with a younger friend and she was about to leave house and uh, her mother was, uh, you know, the same things as I uh, had gone through when I was 20, 21. Uh, so when, when I was talking to her and kind of like guiding her like an, like an older sister, I was struck by the fact that this is still happening. And I got so mad, but actually so hurt. Um, and I thought, wait a minute, there are so many people that I know that are living double lives or, you know, and on one hand I could see the parents, like kind of frozen in time, really loving their children, they know they have to revise their parenthood but they don't know how, and at the same time the younger generation who is living and, you know, who wants to be free and do things differently. And both sides so loving each other, but so, you know, not being able to reach each other. So I thought this has to, this, I, we have to get this conversation going on. And then I thought, well, 
you know, I, I'm not going to ask somebody else. I'm an actress, I'm a writer, so I have to do it myself because when I thought about my mother, I thought, oh, there are a lot of things I don't speak with her uh, about, um, you know. Um, and the thing is, my mother, I must say, she is, um, I'm truly my mother's daughter. My mother is an artist by, by soul. She understands the language. So when I went to her and I asked her, you know, there are so many things happening uh, between us and they, they happened and I want to speak about that, but not in our safe environment. I want to do it, you know, in the Bali. There was this, you know, you came there in Amsterdam with 100 people that we don't know. I want to have this open, you know, this public discussion with you. Uh, she said, yes. And I think on intuition. And later on, when we did the play and uh, we did the tour, just two weeks before the tour, my mother didn't even know it was sold out everywhere and it was sold to 50 theaters, you know. But then I, I waited for the right timing and uh, because she definitely didn't want to go on tour or anything. And, and at one point I felt this is the time and I asked her and I th at that moment I realized I had never asked my mother anything. And... Um, and I also instinctively knew this is something she wants to do also. She wants her voice to be heard. And I was right. Yeah. Oh. I mean, uh, there's quite a lot of painful things that she said to you. I mean, that, that you know, from th there's a part where, like, about you talk about throwing stones and uh, being slapped and being called a witch. and Being, um, you know, checked for virginity up until 14, yeah. Oh. How, how, do you, how did you get beyond that? Because I think that's something that could be unforgivable. Well, the thing, the weird thing is my coping mechanism was, I was, quote unquote, already beyond that. Because I became very, um, you know, like spiritual, spiritual superego. I want to forgive, I want to, you know, all of those things. So my work that I needed to do was first of all, I knew I'm not interested in blame. I'm not interested in uh, why did you do it? If it's an honest you know, conversation, uh, I'm not interested in changing her. That's, you know, that's common sense. That's not how I want to live my life. So that I knew. And, uh, uh, and then we were together with Anlad, we were searching for a tone. How are we going to do this? How can we... Um, get out of the guilt, you know? So uh, we, in our heads, we kind of made it like court. You know, Your Honor, I have this case. I, I am building my case, you know? So then it's like clean. And, um, and the public can decide, or it's just two people, you know, telling uh, the other one and the public, this is me. But what Adlet, uh, my director, really needed to work on uh, was... And I can still sometimes see it. I'm now further than, than, you know, sometimes. She needed to work on um, me being present in front of my mother, asking her, you checked my virginity. I was 14, I'm laying there, my feet, you know, my legs apart. And you laughed, no, or, you know, there was a notion inside of you that this is not normal. I could sense that, and in that instance, I felt the courage to say no for the first time. You stopped, you laughed as if nothing had happened. You know, those things, I would not feel them because I was so far away from it, because it was so painful. Or when my mother says, oh, with your uh, ex-husband, you, you got him circumcised, you're stupid. I would have lied. That's a big betrayal, you know? And I could not feel it because my coping mechanism had become suppressing or laughing or numb, you know? So that's, that was the real work. And my real courage was to stand there to be able to feel the pain and not become like water or nothing, you know? Not become like... I, I didn't know how to do that. I was so vulnerable. I felt so ashamed that I was not able to... You know, and I was very afraid also that something Adelaide had to continuously. I, I trust only one person in the whole wide world. If you want to do anything like this, 
you have to go to Adelaide Rose. Really. Now, I'm not saying this because she's a genius. Um, so I trusted her that it would be just. I knew my mother was in safe hands. But I kept on repeatedly being afraid that the public might hate my mother. I wanted to, you know, protect her. But what I didn't know is that I was afraid of my own hate towards my mother that I <laughs> thought, you know, people were going to feel. It was my own um, unallowed childish hate. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I think there's lots of people here who've had really difficult circumstances with their families, been abused even, um, almost killed. Um, and um, Your mic seems yeah. to be working. Is it working? Yeah. yeah. And, and still there's this really deep-seated need to be loved by your family and to be accepted by them and to do anything possible to have that relationship. It, it's... It's always very mind-boggling for me that, you know, uh, because it, it's sort of, it doesn't matter what they've done, you just want that love. Well, I think that's two-sided. First of all, you have like the Stockholm Syndrome, of course, you're like the child, and you cannot fathom that the god and the goddess are bad, so you, they have to be good, you know, but that's the childish side. The other human and spiritual side, good spirituality, you know, like the real <laughs> spirituality, not the, not the bogus one for me then, eh? is um, I have come to see that, you know, biologically and in our, in our uh, uh, society, the, the societies that we come from, there is no, it's not an I culture, there is no uh, individuality. A part who you are is your family. You know, so that's one thing. It's, it's biologically, it's, it's like dying when you get shunned from your family. Um, and the second thing is, I think, first of all, everybody has a right uh, to, to belong to a family, to have a father and a mother. And, um, and I think it is also wholesome and really... I don't want to, I, I don't, this is my own opinion, huh? I don't want to, if, if you guys can, you know, uh, do it differently in your life or whatever, but for me, as I came to understand for myself, you know, mentally, psychologically, as a woman, as a mother, as a human being, as a spiritual being, with this life experience, for me, it has become vital to truly um, forgive my parents, and love my parents. Yeah. It is very much connected with self-love. Mm. Thank you. So we'll come back to you, and please feel free to keep um, uh, bringing your points in, because they're so important. But I, I want to get to everybody, but I wanted to talk to you, Savin. Savin's a psychologist, and um, we were talking earlier about this combination of both shame and guilt. Yes. If you can talk a bit about that. Um, well, sh often when we think about shunning, we think that it is the act of being shunned that causes the psychological implications. But shunning as a tactic, um, it's shame and guilt are used, and they induce those emotions and in individuals in order to have power and control over them. Shame and guilt are often uh, used interchangeably, but they're two different emotions. They are the only emotions that are related to, um, they are called moral emotions, and they are to do with self-evaluation. Shame is identified as a feeling that is good socially, but it's not good for the individual. And those two emotions are different because shame is about what I it's about who you are. So researchers distinguish the two. If you're ashamed about something, it's I am, I am bad. If you're guilty, I have done something bad. In the movie, we watched that the mother said, if you don't marry this guy, we will kill ourselves. That individual feels responsible for that and it's often used. This is the guilt tactic. It is used to control the individual's choices. So that individual cannot make a choice that is autonomous. So that agency is taken away from them and they must do what it is accepted collectively within the community. 
When it comes to shame, things become far more complicated because as we saw towards the end, the bro brother getting angry is almost that something he's done to him. Uh, but it's the individual and that individual then feels shame about um, what they have done. Then also shame about feeling the shame. Why should something like this be, uh, you should be ashamed of? And imagine the individual then going to seek help outside to somebody who is not aware of uh, the rules of that community. They then felt shame on a, on a third level. Shame itself, it's something natural. We all experience it. But when you experience it excessively, it leads to suicide. It leads to eating disorders and other severe mental health issues. And this comes from research on normal shame. Now, I want you to just take a second and imagine when you feel you have brought shame to your family and to your community for simply wanting to make choices that are concerned, you, that are to do with yourself. That has the implications gets tripled, if not more. Yeah. Can I just, I'm sorry, I'm so interested in, the, in those two concepts, shame and guilt, because I realized, um, first of all, <laughs> I also more and more uh, realized that, uh, and this is, this is like half a year ago, I realized this, that um, throughout my whole life, uh, um, I was not only disobedient or whatever, first of all, we all cannot help who we are. This is not a choice, this is who we are, yeah? This is, this is uh, uh, our way of being and living, so. Uh, and the second, I realized that I have been severely uh, um, brainwashed. Not only my, my, uh, um, the way I had to dress or behave was violated, but also everything inside my head was violated. Um, uh, and with the sh uh, shame and guilt, I realized the if you experience shame and guilt, um, it is more difficult to change stuff in yourself than if you don't have shame and guilt. And that's why, if you can, uh, you know, track track in yourself if you have shame and guilt, and try to um, make amends with it. Yeah. And I'm um, just adding to your point. It's from a very young age, they are um, pro not programmed, it's conditioned mm -hmm. to think of what is shameful and not. I mean, think about uh, every religion starts off with the story of the um, uh, Adam and Eve. Eve, when she eats the apple, she realizes she's naked and immediately she wants to cover up. The word shame itself is rooted in covering up, dishonor. So from very young age, they are primed. And there was something that your mother said, oh, you could have said a white lie. You could have just told me, why is that? Because she doesn't want to hold the responsibility. So at least if you lie to me, it's not my responsibility. I'm not bringing the shame and I'm not guilty for lying to the rest of the people in the community. It is you. Um, the, the problem uh, is like girls especially, Girls, especially, uh, who are born and raised in uh, religious households, they are brainwashed, indoctrinated, and they are taught to be, you know, ashamed of their bodies. It's like you, you have something, you are an embodiment of something which can cause, you know, uh, some, some kind of mayhem in the society if you are very much open about yourself or you are... Uh, you know, not covering yourself from head to toe, or even partially, or you go outside and t talk about your own choices. So it's, it's kind of, I would say, inbuilt in, in these girls, especially, that they, they feel uh, like guilty, um, as we just watched in the movie. First of all, uh, very much uh, uh, congratulations. It was uh, beautiful. Uh, beautifully, uh, you know, projected the fears and uh, the struggle. Many girls uh, who are born and raised in uh, religious households, they they are having or they are trying to be free, uh, you know, with, from this struggle. The concept of sacrifice from female member of the family, it's, it's very common in 
conservative household that you have to sacrifice for the honor, for the satisfaction, or whatever reason, what, whatever makes family feel comfortable. You know, you have to sacrifice your choices, your, your own selves. And in doing so, you, um, you are not always in a position, you know, to come up with something because the way a brother is shouting at sister that you were uh, selfish, you were selfish because you did not care about us. And why did she not care about you? Because she thought uh, about herself. She wanted to embrace herself, her body, her soul, her thoughts, her choice. And there she, uh, you know, violated the so-called family honor. And this is how it's, it's not always like, uh, or not all girls, they can just um, be comfortable uh, with the breaking up uh, uh, with the norms and uh, the tradition of the family. Mostly they sacrifice themselves thinking that, okay, myself, my body, my life is nothing whatever I'm doing because you know the love with the family you showed in this movie is so strong that many of the women and it's it's a pity that many women they decide to just give up themselves like their own choices their own fa life for the sake of their family because they don't want to get away uh, uh, get away from uh, this guilt they, they want to live with this guilt that, yes, I am not what I am, but what I'm doing is just okay for the family. And my family is cool. I am with my family, and that is enough. I, can I, I'm laughing now because, um, you know, I, I, um, I find this very important to say. If it, initially, if it were up to me, I would marry that guy. I would not do anything wrong. I would sacrifice myself if only if I could have done that. Um, and this is a child speaking, you know? If, when I was 18, 19, if I could have done that, I would have gladly done that. But, uh, you know, then I got some uh, weird psychological stuff going on out of the, I was in a pressure cooker and it felt like I was dying and I had to, you know? But this is, I'm saying this because I think sometimes when you're young or in what, what kind of situation you are, um, I don't want anyone to at least look at me and think, oh, well, maybe she's born like, whoa, and you know, no, 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 so, yeah. No, okay. I would say, like, you oh. are, sorry, you are an inspiration, I would say, for many women who uh, would watch this or who are watching this movie. Mm -hmm. You are an inspiration, but... Not always this is for everyone. Like mm -hmm. many, many girls, they, they cannot just uh, break their shackles. They live with that, they die with that, mm -hmm. and uh, all they care about is just my family is happy and I want to be with family. And this is where the family has to, uh, the, the family member have to realize that, that what they are doing, they are being actually selfish, not that girl. Exactly. They are just, uh, they are killing her spirit, her soul. They are dominating her life. But here we have the struggle that we just watched in this movie. There's uh, so many great discussions taking place, and I still want to get to uh, you. I guess let me go to you, Faye, because um, I suppose yours is the other side of the story, where you're completely disowned and uh, you cannot have a relationship with your family. Talk a bit um, about that. Yeah, so um, I'm quite open about talking about the fact that I'm disowned because I can't really, especially people that I make long-term relationships with, be that in work or in friendships, I really don't like starting off by telling them that everything's fine because very much so in my personal life and my family life, everything is not fine. So often I will tell people that I'm disowned and then the natural question is, what do you mean, why? And I say the three main reasons are because I reported my father because he was violent towards me. Um, I refused to get married and I left Islam. And the general reaction to that is, yeah, that'll do it. Um, and um, I got disowned in 2018 after all of that went down. And um, it's been really difficult to wrap my head around that because um, I feel like unlike a lot of people, I was quite emotionally attached to Islam. And when I lost it, I couldn't 
lie about it anymore. Like it, it just became that I just wanted to be myself. And for a long time, I was very disciplined. I stifled who I wanted to be, who, um, you know, the things that I loved. I'm, you know, I'm an artist by nature. I stopped drawing because that's haram. I stopped listening to music because that's haram. I stopped watching TV because that's haram. I focused so much of my energy in just putting it into the religion. So when I left and I lost my faith in that, it became almost like a heartbreak because I, I couldn't come to terms with it. But not only that, I couldn't even talk to anybody about it. And I didn't find this community until a year later. Um, so for me, it was a very difficult and painful journey. And then when it comes to um, actually deciding to choose between keeping your family or being yourself, it's really hard to choose because I want both. And um, when your family bring you that question, because one of the first people I told was one of my aunts, and she said, you're, you're going to have to choose, because if you come out and you be yourself, your family is not going to accept you anymore. Um, and that's exactly what happened. She actually suggested that I get a marriage of convenience, um, because she thought that would be the best way. And I said, do I really want to live the rest of my life lying and scheming because I'd done that for a year, you know, living a double life. And it, it was kind of eating away inside of me because you, when you lie that much, you kind of create a web of lies that you have to now keep up with. Um, and I just wanted to stop doing that. I wanted to be honest. I wanted to be myself. Um, and it was really, really difficult to do that. And what about you, Saf? I guess you're uh, in between the two of them because you had a difficult time with your family, but you're sort of building some bridges. Yeah, so a lot of what this was film was about kind of hit hard in places, especially at the age it was happening, surrounded by university and the conversations with the mother as well. Um, so, oh yeah, it's kind of in, be in between the two. Um, my parents found out I, about my double life and then I was sort of confronted by it without knowing. Mm -hmm. So I'd gone home and this conversation sort of was forced out of me and out of nowhere, I couldn't really explain it, it came out of my mouth and I was like, I'm not religious, I don't believe in God, none of that. Um, and the second thing was I don't want an arranged marriage. Those were the two things that I sort of focused on. Um, it was more... I think because my mother, she she's the, she was one who raised us. She was a homemaker, so she taught us all of the religion, all of this sort of stuff. So it was more difficult for her to take on. Um, then I went back to university because I had exams, and it was in that sort of three or four month period. I felt like I couldn't come. I was told I couldn't come home, and it was that sort of that moment where I was like. We don't want to have to lie to our community, the rest of the family, about this. And I was like, oh, well, I don't want to have to lie to you anymore. You know everything now. Um, so I said, I can't keep doing this. These conversations, they were draining. At one point, I had to have my friends in the room and write down on a piece of paper what to say because I just couldn't get the words out. And it was then my dad called me up later in the evening saying, we're coming to get you, coming to bring you home. And I was sort of confronted to have those conversations with my parents. And they sort of eventually accepted it as long as, I remember my sister telling me that my mum said, as long as nobody else found out about it. <laughs> and then, <laughs> that didn't last. Yeah, it, because again, yeah, that didn't last very long. <laughs> um, and that was mostly because of the other young ex-Muslims I was talking to, the ones living in Pakistan, the ones living in UAE who was, couldn't be themselves, couldn't tell their parents, because of the countries that they were living in, I was like, well, look at me, I'm in the UK. My parents know now, I don't really care. I have to speak for these people, at least allow them to have their voices heard. And one of my closest friends from there, who I started the podcast we run, um, he was doing it from Pakistan as a gay atheist. So I was like, well, I'm living here. Like, what's yeah. the risk? I'm just risking the shame of the community, the shame of my extended family finding out. But my parents now still have always had my back behind it. My dad still sends me text messages almost every day saying, you know, I'm proud of you, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think it's mostly because he was worried that I didn't feel like I could come home. But now I do. And in the podcast and certain topics we've discussed, it's forced me to have conversations with my mum that I wouldn't normally had. And we sort of address it sometimes. Sometimes it gets too heated and emotional because it is an emotional thing. 
but we can have those conversations. And now for like my younger sister, it's gonna make that easier for her if she chooses whatever sort of spiritual side, whatever she wants to do, it's happened to me. So she doesn't have to go through that hardship and I'd happily do it again. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess uh, one of the things that came up in the film and also uh, what you were saying is this whole thing of uh, it's okay as long as nobody else knows about it. And I think it's, it's quite upsetting when you think it's just about what other people think. Mm -hmm. And I want to come to you, Shabana, because her parents didn't, uh, and your brother didn't um, uh, attack you because of... Uh, who you were, and your family's restaurant was shot at because they didn't kill you in the name of honor. So this constant pressure to conform. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, what happened that I started as a um, comedian and also a performance artist. So I used my, my body and um, my comedy and was spoken actually not not more f outspoken than other Norwegian comedians, uh, but still it was uh, quite uh, unique from uh, of a girl from my b background. I, uh, I was born in Pakistan and came to Oslo when I was two years old. Um, so my mother uh, is religious and my uh, father was uh, really secular and um, they supported my choice of um, whatever I would like to do. And I have four brothers, and we have quite, you know, like you, I have uh, older siblings who took the hard things <laughs> before me. And so I was really spoiled and didn't, wasn't aware of um, the social control in the community because my family didn't go to the mosques. Um, so, so I was unaware of how much control it, it really is out there. Uh, but suddenly, some months after my comedy became famous, uh, I started to receive death threats from the people from uh, mostly Pakistani background in, in Norway. And um, I continued my work, and uh, then they started to um, send threats to my family. And uh, my brother's uh, friends, even from the childhood, stop talking to them. And, you know, they start to harass them and ask them, you are not, um, you are not uh, a good brother, you are not good Muslims, you are not, even you are not, uh, you know, you are not, you can be a male, you know, because you are not, uh, ha you don't have your sister in control. And, you know, we didn't care about that, but okay, people will speak. We have to support each other and do whatever we are doing. Uh, but then uh, one night, four o'clock in the morning, um, a car drove by my uh, sister's restaurant and they shot 18 bullet holes through the window. And uh, it was a quite uh, message to my family that uh, to control me. And, um, you know, it was, uh, w what to do then? You know, um, of course my family get really scared, uh, and me too. Um, uh, and then of course the media was, was there asking what to do now. And the, the funny thing is that the media uh, asked me that if I regret anything. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just realized that uh, the public are not used to discuss this issue and to understand, you know, what principles we are discussing this out of. So I was, I was feeling um, that the shame and the fear was putting on me and my actions, even from the Norwegian society and the media, because they really couldn't uh, understand why someone are so angry at a comedian in Norway that they start shooting. Um, but luckily, I think the debate opened up and um, a lot of things happened after that as well. And it threw my family even in discussion, we should actually write a stage yes, playoff. I think so. Too. Yeah, the discussion my brothers and sister had Our after. mothers should meet. Yeah. <laughs> And also, also my, my poor mom, what she went through, because the whole community stopped talking to her as well. 
And it is a lot of pain which is there, which we haven't, you know. So I think this, this film, the, the, the pain, the healing, which is also in the movie, the white lies, everything, it will open so many doors in the hearts, in the families, that it should just be continued. And I will right now invite this to Oslo, actually, yes. to have a screening <laughs> there as well. Uh, so it, it's been very hard, but uh, my family grow um, after that. Um, the debate grow, and it became more open. But it, this was the price I, I paid. Yes, sure. I, I'm going to come to you also because I want. Uh, I mean, one thing I want to add to that is, apart from the family and so-called community pressure, is this pressure from the larger society. You know, uh, when you go somewhere to speak, when you want to hire venues, including this one. You know, uh, the concern that they have a duty of care towards their Muslim staff. They would never. Um, talk about a duty of care to their atheist staff if Muslims were coming to speak. And this constant pressure you feel just because you want to say that you're an atheist from a Muslim background or you, uh, you know, uh, don't want to live a certain way. And I, I wonder, can we not even call that shunning? You know, what universities do to us, what venues do to us. It's, it's they, they, they sort of collaborate with the community and family shunning it's trying to be uh, can i go yeah um so as me and saf we both do some stuff online yeah. um we're, we're online personalities and what we've found is that the the margin for support that we have is very small because there are a few right-wing people a few left-wing people a couple of people in the center and then it's just ex-muslims um there there is we're, we're kind of against everybody um, sometimes, because um, I think that there's this need on the left to protect uh, a Muslim minority here in the country, which we do understand. We are part of that minority, um, and we, we understand that. But this freedom to be able to say whatever we want is not being respected and suppressed. Um, so it is something that we, we're constantly aware of, because we're constantly fighting right to left, left to right, because we're dead center in the middle, and we don't have any support. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it you kind of have to be very careful. Like, I've had to block a lot of right when people start following me and stuff like that. But the amount of times, that I've the amount of times yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of, like, the threats that I got were, you're mentally ill, that's your problem, that's why you've left religion. I was like, no, I do have mental illness, but that's nothing to do with religion. Um, I found that is some support from the Muslim community, but that comes from Muslims in Very the US French. and Canada. It's not Muslims from the UK, I've had none. There is There was there, one Muslim girl, uh, yeah. two of them, that when we posted that selfie thread that actually stood up and was like, you guys need Tara. to stop doing Tara and yeah. Sarah. <laughs> Sarah has become one of my yeah. very good friends now, and I had her on our podcast, mm -hmm. and she talks about her experiences from doubting religion to going back to now still finding her feet in it. Um, sometimes I'll engage in conversations with any of these people yeah. and it will feel like it's productive. And then at the end, they'll pick one word and just be like, oh, so you are this. And it will just completely destroy the whole narrative. Like they were just sitting there waiting for you to say something that wasn't quite right, you know. Um, and I, I don't know if it's this necessity to put us in a box and be like, they have to be aligned with this certain ideology or that certain ideology. Um, that also saying that categorizing ex-Muslims as one thing is completely wrong, because I've met ex-Muslims from all walks of life. Um, and it, it's just, it's a shame. It's a shame that something, like a persecuted minority within a minority isn't protected. Mm -hmm. Like we are not given the same standing as other people. And they in, it, this is done sometimes to be politically correct when it's actually been politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget something. Shannon historically have been used by community leaders to exclude people who would not obey to those beliefs. Now, in your case, where the family gets attacked for not um, punishing somebody for bringing dishonor, the family will get attacked. This is to send a message to the rest of the group so that they do not follow in their footsteps. And we must remember that shunning 
it is a form of abuse. It has been historically to punish people. It's a death penalty. What we mean by death penalty or a social death, it's that humans, we are inherently want to be part of a group. It's a, we want to belong uh, with a community. It's, it's, we are social animals. That's the worst thing you can do to a person. It is to shun them and exclude them and isolate them from the rest of the community. Researchers currently, when they look at shunning, they look at bullying, bullying in workplace. Bullying in workplace is different to the kind of shunnings we are talking about because that is just in the workplace. They don't lose the family. They don't have to give up their homes, their, their jobs, their whole identity as to who they are. Whereas if you're from a community, especially a community that practices honor-based violence, you do, once you leave, you have to give up your whole life as you know it. And also to just add to that, I feel as though also as women, um, when we grow up in these families, we are completely dependent on them. So when you are shunned from your family as a woman, you lose your financial standing, you lose your emotional support, you lose, like when I, from my family, I wasn't really allowed to make friends outside of my community. So most of my friends were in family, my cousins and my aunts. And when my entire family shunned me, I had nobody and I had nothing. Um, and it's just this, it's this way of completely isolating you and taking everything away from you and, and literally keeping you at rock bottom. Uh, can we just show, uh, we want to show you a film. It's just a th two minute clip from Dia Khan's Islam's Non-Believers. And it's uh, the head of the Muslim Association of Britain explaining shunning. Dr. Umar Al Hamdoun has held a number of senior positions in mainstream Islamic organizations. He says no one is compelled to be a Muslim. People can leave of their own free will and shouldn't be punished. But he accepts that shunning does happen. The Muslim community is a community uh, that is uh, based on religion. So if a person chooses to stop being a Muslim, they can't really expect that the Muslim community is still going to say to them, you're part of our community, because, because you've left Islam, you've left the religion. The family do need to try and resolve their issues by sitting together, talking about uh, matters. But I do understand that, you know, if a family holds religion very deep to their heart, that when they see one of their members has left that religion, they feel a sense of betrayal. And obviously, a lot of people will just say, look, I can't deal with this, so I just shun that member out because he's betrayed me. Islam does put a big emphasis on faith, and sometimes somebody might have to reject uh, something or a certain person because their attitude towards uh, faith. That, that can happen. Would you do that? I, children? Yes, I have children, yes. Would, would you reject your children? I wouldn't reject my uh, child. I pro uh, my, my, my approach would be to sit with them and discuss with them. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shun them off, but I suppose, I suppose they would expect that things aren't the same. If a child goes against your, say, general plan, expectation, if they go against you, you might feel, uh, you know, that, okay, you, you're still my son, daughter, but, you know, I wasn't expecting that of you. Uh, I, I do want to just mention that uh, I debated him at, uh, on a meeting on Sharia law, and he had said at the meeting that he doesn't think stoning should take place. And I asked him, but what about in a country under Islamic law? And he said yes. And so when he says about people shouldn't be killed for uh, leaving Islam, he means here in Britain. Uh, but that's not very clear in the film. Uh, and uh, again, so I think... Uh, I want to end with a quick comment from uh, Sabine on this because, you know, she's written an article in, in response to him about how shunning is a form of social death penalty and long-term psychological torture. And I think we do need to start looking at it like that. So if you can explain that, and if you don't mind, then we'll open it up to the audience. I think I have covered most of the um, points that I mentioned earlier as well, uh, but shunning has long-term consequences on individuals. And um, often some people think of 
a form of physical abuse, you know, to be physically punished. But it's not those physical forms of abuses. The psychological effects um, are long-term lasting. And it can be compared to somebody who has gone through torture. Because an individual that has been in a community where every aspect of their life is controlled, all choices are made for them, um, later when they move away from that, they lose everything. But a part of it's very difficult for them to rebuild their sense of self. Thank you. And I guess one of the questions we should be focusing on too is how can we make sure that shunning is seen to be something that is no longer acceptable? The sorts of things we need to do. I think your film is, is one of those things. Um, yeah, and, and those um, conversations. Thanks. I also wanted to add that, um, you know, I am from the Turkish tradition and the Muslim tradition from the Turkish side. And um, uh, uh, of course, all those people, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, people who are believing and following the rules of the tradition, they have, they seem to have this right to stay in the tradition and to own the tradition. So they would have this thing towards me, for instance, like uh, um, you don't believe and you don't obey the rules, so it's not your tradition. But I think it's very important for us, all of us, to, um, to say no. It is also my tradition. It's my birthright to co-create that tradition towards new generations. It is mine, also mine. So that's what I, uh, yeah. Thank you. So um, anybody has questions or comments, please feel free. You keep that mic. Okay. Sorry. You guys can share it. I can run this oh, one. there's one there. So it's all right. Um, there's one there. So you use it for this. Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Go ahead. And then we've got. Yeah. Oh, thank sorry, you. Was it? Sorry, I didn't see where you were um, going. To. Um, Oh, should I do it? Yeah, I forgot I'm the yeah, chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then maybe the three of you could speak and put it forward and then we'll send it back. Sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just have a couple of questions. First for uh, Nazmia. Uh, <laughs> we just watch you. For I'm half. from Holland, eh? so everybody's <laughs> like, "Hey, nice meal." <laughs> so uh, the first question is like, uh, arranged marriage or marrying at a very young age is also another form of getting women to submit or at, uh, or suppressing them. Uh, you've been through actually both of those aspects at the age of 18, and you mentioned it took you about 18 months to actually break up with the guy who you weren't in love with, what would you tell younger women today at the age of 18 to actually do that more productively or actually do it in a better way that it doesn't take them 18 months to get out of something? And the second question, uh, for everybody can chip in on that, uh, what difference do you see in, uh, in behavior in women from diaspora communities or communities or from Pakistan or countries like Iran? What difference do you see from your childhood to now where you're actually observing those women actually coming out and asking for their rights or actually standing up in, uh, for what they believe in. Is there a difference from your childhood to now that you see? That's a couple of questions. Uh, can I ask, that we have a few more questions and then we can ask the panel to respond, so. Uh, so my question is, I think what we saw, like what we saw in, in the conversation with your family was, quite anomalous, actually. So there was uh, a level of sophistication in the dialogue between yourself and your mum and a heightened level of emotional intelligence uh, in the discourse. Oh, no. Why is the they mic on? Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's working. It's working. I'm just joking. Um, so there was, a you know, it was really quite a sophisticated dialogue between you. But... Uh, I think for myself, and we saw this in the clip with the gentleman that you debated afterwards, I think actually his position is far more indicative of the level of interpersonal sophistication within our community. That actually we don't even know the idea that your child would leave Islam and you wouldn't shun him 
you know, or that you could be okay with him, or that your child would be gay and you would still have a conversation with him. So I feel like what we saw between your mum and yourself was this really elevated level of interpersonal relationship and conversation. But actually the reality in our communities is much more base and compared to uh, Western wider society is kind of at a deficit actually. Uh, and I wonder how we go about moving that up. Because I think it, we saw it manifest in some, some ways, like when we saw your brother's reaction, that's much more normative, I think, for, for those of us in honor communities than seeing the open, honest, frank, painful conversation that you had with your mum. Uh, can I just take one more question and then we'll, we'll open it up and anyone on the panel can respond as well. Sohe. Yeah, this is uh, more of a comment. So, um, yeah, I'm an ex-Muslim. I'm also gay, so I'm really glad that Nazmia mentioned uh, gay people in the in the in the uh, film that we watched. Um, basically, I'm also a former extremist. Funnily enough, um, uh, basically, when I was kind of growing up, my family became like Salafi Muslims, and my mom started wearing the face veil, and she was the one who was kind of pushing the whole religion thing on my dad, rather than the other way around. Um, and when I was a teenager, I realized I was gay. I experienced shame um, as the, what's the name of the clinical psychologist, sorry? Savine. So, Savine. And, and as, as, as Savine mentioned, it was, uh, I experienced a lot of shame, so I wanted to get forgiveness. So I read what the, the, the scholars in Saudi Arabia said, and they said, you have to become more religious. Now, I was Salafi, right? Becoming more religious <laughs> meant becoming crazy, right? <laughs> So here I am on the, on the verge of actual violence, and this is serious, I'm, I'm on the verge of actual violence, like full on jihad and stuff. And uh, thankfully I managed to get, get myself back from that. And I start experiencing doubts in Islam, I end up becoming an ex-Muslim, um, and I, one day my parents find out on the same day that I'm ex-Muslim and gay. Um, immediately, now that's, that's the double whammy, they immediately, they told me to, they kicked me out of the house, they just get the fuck out, right? And um, I packed my bag and um, they called me back, I came back, they made me go through exorcisms and three months of that, um, and eventually I had to leave. Uh, that, and that was, that was it, I haven't spoken to them for five years, um, I dream about my family and my brothers and sisters all the time, like literally every night. Um, but it's, it's, it is what it is. I just wanted to, to ask, what do, you, what do you make of that? It's, I, I also experienced like a chronic like pain condition that's caused by emotional trauma, fibromyalgia. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to get the, the thoughts of, of, of Savine and anyone else on the panel who wanted to come in. Okay, should, should we have Nazmi and then Savine and anybody else who wants to respond? First of all, I'm not a psychologist, of course, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very sorry for you, especially when you're dreaming about your family and having this, you know, obviously, I'm sure you have, like, PTSS, CPTSS and everything. Anyways, um, I'm wishing you good luck, and I leave your <laughs> thing to the real uh, um, expert. Um, to get back on the 18-year-old girl, you know, I don't know. Because it's very easy to say, uh, pff, uh, talk to your mother. I tried, and she didn't listen. It's very easy to say, say no. I did, but they didn't listen. One thing I think I could have done was that my mother initially, you know, she was very happy, and she came to me, and she said, oh, my God, your auntie, blah, 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 um, they proposed, like, they wanted you to get married with their son. What do you think? Think about it. And then a week later, she came and she said, she didn't ask me, you know, yes or no. She, she just said, told me, next weekend they're coming to ask for your hand. So then I knew it's already done deal, yeah? So I would suggest maybe in my case, maybe I should have spoken earlier, the most early, you know, when she said, think about it, yes or no. I shouldn't have gone into comatose uh, being coma, but you know, yeah, of course. Um, so you, you didn't actually say no, 
um, to your arranged marriage, but I actually did say no to my arranged marriage, and they set up the wedding behind my back anyway. Um, so it, I think it's it's really difficult, like you said, to like give one advice when there's when it's really difficult. When it's really difficult to just talk to your family, because as um, Jimmy had asked, it's we don't have that level of conversation. Like I'm pretty sure, even at my um, the age of 18 or 20, my parents didn't really know who I was, or I didn't even really know who they were, because we didn't have conversations yeah, like never. that. No, me neither. Never. We, we don't know how to speak. Yeah. How can they protect themselves so, because they don't have to live through those 18 uh, studies? <laughs> Get become a, only become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Khadija and then uh, Sabin. Yeah, it, it's like um, uh, I, I'm from Pakistan, and uh, I can say that uh, somebody asked me, like, uh, do you identify yourself as a feminist? And then I said, like, uh, there was a pause period, I would say, because when I was in Pakistan, I was proudly, uh, like, I was uh, believing that, yes, I am a feminist, because in Pakistan, it's, it's very clear what is uh, like to be a feminist. You talk about equality, you talk about, like, uh, equal opportunities and uh, respect, dignity, and uh, your right to, to, to live with all your basic rights. But when I came uh, to, to Germany, I, like, I, I saw the, the meaning of feminism is different, bit different here, when I saw many famous people and many women who are supporting all those regressive traditions and practices that I've been fighting against, and it was like, hold on, <laughs> I have to, you know, rethink my position, what I want to be. But then um, I met these fabulous ladies and then many other people who, who could, I can just, uh, like, relate myself to them. And, yes, I, I could say that, yes, I am a feminist. And uh, the most disturbing thing was that when I would discuss, I write, I write articles about human rights, women's rights, minority rights, and Islamism and extremism. When I talk about this, then I just keep this, this thing in my mind that I have come from that background. I know the realities. I have lived the experiences. I know the traditions, the rituals, because I've been a part of that thing. But when I, but when I would discuss those things here, uh, some people would come to me and say, maybe you have got something wrong. Maybe there is something you should, uh, you should, you know, think about and you, you, you are not very much clear about. So <laughs> that's, that's a really interesting thing because I believe that uh, if you look back into history, uh, Western history, our experiences are no more different than yours, like what you had in your past the misogyny, the religious misogyny, this uh, oppression, this uh, shunning uh, in the name of, uh, you know, offending religious sensibilities, it, it was all there. We are experiencing this now. And saying that these things are alien to the Western understanding of uh, women's liberation is, is not fair. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Let me have uh, Shabana first, sorry, speak, and then Nazmi, and then you. Yeah, I just want to say what um, uh, are different now from 20 years ago in Norway, I can, because now we have this government-funded organization, uh, Born Free, which I'm leading, and it's the first time in Norwegian history they actually ha are funding an organization who works ex ex uh, especially against honor and shame culture, building networks, giving advices, and like you were into that, you know, there are so many different situations when a young uh, boy or girl need uh, an advice. So I think what we can do is to be visible to, uh, uh, you know, even as journalists, artists, public speakers, to, sh to um, uh, normalize, to break the taboos, discuss about this, tell them it can be dangerous or you, you can have a dial dialogue, but s speak to us about the different uh, choices you have. And if you're afraid, we should be there so they can recognize that it's all right to have these feelings, 
to you know to feel for your dignity your your rights and to have these thoughts it's not forbidden it's nothing to be ashamed of so we have to be there the, it's like our generation's biggest duty to be there recognize and just hope for development um, um, oh, yeah. um 18 years ago there was not the word honor based violence flying around there was a case of a 16-year-old girl who, who was murdered by her father. She had told the school that her father wanted to kill her and was forcing her to get married. But they were not aware of it. They thought that she's of exaggerating. I spoke to one of the teachers who actually said to me, I had daughters. I, I would never do that. I, di I didn't think any father will ever do that. But now we are more aware of it. There is more training. There is more services available. But we still, there is still loads more that needs to be done. In your, what you mentioned about fibromyalgia and PTSD, let me tell you that PTSD is about a single traumatic event. That is a car accident or something happens once. What you have gone through is not a single event. It's something that happened over a prolonged period of time, which exceeds the expectations that you need in order to meet the diagnosis of PTSD. This is what we call complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which currently there is not an, uh, a treatment available because it's complex. It's different also depending on the things that you have gone through. Now, when you go through a complex trauma and if you are in a community where you have to suppress your thoughts, you have to suppress everything that makes up the who you are, and you feel that it is shameful to even have the thoughts or the needs that you want, that creates a lot of anxiety, creates depression that gets kept inside. They are not expressed. And then later in life, you're you have a very high chance of developing chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, if you're not familiar with, it's a really, it's a devastating condition where you feel physical pain of your muscles, you've got muscle p uh, tension, headaches, uh, tiredness, difficulty concentrating. It's very difficult to continue your life without relying on painkillers, but there is not a solution, there is not a cure. There are other ways of managing the pain, and you have to think that taking painkillers has a lot of side effects as well. Um, so there are possible treatments available, but we have to think if you go to see a therapist in the mainstream mental health services, sometimes I have seen cases where they get overdiagnosed because they think what they're experiencing, it is in the mind, but it's not in the mind. Shannon is not in the mind. It is what is happening around. It is a social issue. You do not miss your family. You do not have suicidal ideations because you're suffering from depression. Your depression is a result of being shunned which and in therapy, mainstream therapy, challenges your thoughts. So if you're experiencing shame, they will challenge your thoughts. Why do you think you are bad? Can you give me an example of why you're bad? Other times where you haven't felt bad. Of course I feel bad. I feel bad because my family doesn't even want to have anything to do with me. There is so much proof to... Uh, to suggest that my negative thought is actually real, whereas their job is to challenge your negative thought and find evidence that doesn't support it. And then the work becomes very messy. Can I, um, uh, okay, Nazmia, do you want to uh, say something? And then shall we ask, get some more questions and we'll come back so we give some more time to the audience. I just want to address uh, your uh, question, yeah, about the uh, elevated emotional intelligence and how to speak to people who don't have that kind of, yeah? How to elevate the collective <laughs> intelligence. Well, <clears throat> I must say with, with our play, we have been touring also the community houses in Holland. So not only theater where white people come and a few, you know, colored people, but um, community houses where 99.9% uh, .9 of the audience was um, Somalian, Moroccan, Turkish, you know, from our cultures. And uh, the first time that my mother uh, um, was about to, to um, go on stage, she, uh, then I realized she didn't uh, uh, understand what she was doing all the time because she was doing in theater and she was like, ah, these Dutch people, Dutch people, I don't care, you know? 
But then she was in this community house, and our dressing room was the computer room, you know, where they had these lessons. And she needed to go to the toilet, so she went, and outside were women, veiled women, who were like her. And they were going to be the audience. So that was the first time when, my, when it hit my mother, what she was about uh, going to do. Um, so she came back, and she immediately had migraine. And then we went on stage, and we also didn't know uh, what to expect. Um, but I must say, 10 big cities in Holland, uh, including The Hague, including uh, in a neighborhood where a lot of uh, jihadis went to Syria, you know, a lot of uh, Salafists, um, in the audience, there were, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, parents and their kids. And, um, and also what we did with every city, we, beforehand we went and we searched for a mother or a father with an artist kid or a, a homosexual kid or um, uh, a kid who, uh, who didn't, you know, who, who was uh, different, you know. And, um, and two people that had still maybe struggle, but they were together. No longer without you, you know? And they were um, integrated into the play and they told the audience their story. In The Hague, I remember, there was a mother who was there with her transgender daughter, who was used to be a, a boy and now a girl. And the mother was telling how she came about to stand beside her daughter. And what we experienced is that Ten cities, ten uh, uh, you know uh, uh, shows, and all the people were so relieved. They were so relieved because something happened that I knew. Because I'm 50. When I when I was 20, I was one of the first in the community to be different and blah blah. And everybody was like, eh, you know. But I knew life is going on, and, and these all these people are going to get kids, and those kids are going to do stuff, you know. <laughs> So now, yeah, everybody has a daughter who is not a virgin anymore, or who is gay, or who is not obedient. You know, everybody has someone. So all these parents were so relieved. And we, we had, um, uh, because it was in a community house, we had a uh, discussion afterwards with my mother, with me, and then, you know, with the audience. And uh, the girls or the younger uh, people, they were like, you know, completely fallen in love with my mother. They were like, I want you to be my mother. And, um, but mostly people were relieved. Um, and what I want to say is, together with Adlad, we, we um, have founded a, a theater company for 16 years. And our core business is uh, nonviolent loving confrontation and what I have learned in those 16 years I mean come on if I'm confronted with someone who is Salafist and who looks at me like that I'm not gonna bother why you know I'm not gonna I don't need him to or her to you know but 99% of the people uh, for me, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how it is in UK, but in Holland, the people I encountered, and those people were from all walks of life, including Salafists, um, you have to invest time, a lot of time. Uh, I, and, you know, if you don't want to change the other person, if you don't want to shove your, you know, what you believe into their throat, <laughs> I'm saying it a little bit weird, but you know what I mean, um, if you don't want them to acknowledge you, if you only want to say your truth with a bare chest and you're willing to listen to their truth and say, okay, I respect that and this is me, but I'm not leaving you. I'm still part of your community. No, 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 I'm not going to be in the peripheries of the community. No, no, no. This is my birthright. This place, it's mine. I'm staying here. You have to get used to different colors. I mean, nobody, well, in my opinion, um, it must be a really fucked up person to not get open, you know? Really, that's my opinion.
Can, can we have a few more questions? Um, we have one from the unrecorded side, so I'm just going to hand you this. Oh, yeah, sure. OK, great. It's big, I hope. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's not big enough. Uh, shall we, we'll come back to you guys. Shall we do some in the back as well? Let's take four or five questions, just so we make sure everybody gets heard. Go ahead, Sean. And then you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, all right. Uh, I, I just want to make a quick comment on uh, what I'm seeing right now, I can see uh, seven women, and it might be an impression that you know the things that happened to Nazmia in her family, like uh, controlling or trying to force the child or children uh, to do what the parents want. But uh, I have come across uh, many many people, and uh, some of them are male too. It happens to all sorts of the, even transgenders. So I'm from Bangladesh, uh, so I'm speaking about my experience. So uh, we must not forget that this can happen, this sort of behavior can happen to all sorts of people. Um, my question is, uh, do you think that uh, we, we should have more campaigns to uh, like our governments, to make our governments to take more initiatives uh, to take uh, maybe measurements to protect our children yeah, at young ages, like 18, 19, when they don't understand what's going on with them or what the parents are trying to do. And that's, uh, I think, very important. Do you think it, that there should be more campaigns? Okay, yes, the gentleman here as well, if you can, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to share my impression with Nazmi about the film. I get the impression that both of you, your mother, and you are both victims of the religious indoctrination. Uh, it seems to me that your mother has been handicapped by the um, religious uh, programming, whereby she cannot get the full spectrum. She cannot love you as much as she could because of, the, because of Islam. Okay, any other question back there? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, hi. Uh, we heard a lot about how psychologically damaging shunning and that sort of thing is, and also how it's like um, even violent it can become if you try to have these conversations with your family. Um, just from the outside, it seems like uh, sometimes the only options are I can either resign myself to this life or I can sort of cut them out entirely, sort of get away before they have the chance to shun me and do that to me. So my question is, do you have any advice on how to weigh up those options and how to potentially not miss out on that sort of relationship, but also not endanger yourself? That's my question. Thank you. One last question, and I'll read this, and then we'll come back. Nadia, did you want to... Uh, the lady there. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Nazmi, uh, you said that your husband, you forced your husband to have a circumcision. Um, and your mother was more lenient in that respect. So I think it's very important that this idea of circumcision, especially now that uh, it's very big here in the UK, the circumcision of uh, girls, female genital mutilation is very widespread here in England. And I don't know how widespread it is in Holland or maybe in Norway. Uh, can you tell us about this and can you explain to us why is it that you insist that your husband gets a circumcision and your mother was much more lenient than you? Uh, and the question from uh, those who don't want to be filmed, uh, she's written or he's written, um, I'm going through a similar situation where I have to choose between my family and myself. What helped you make your decision and what helped you the most through that? So can we start with, uh, should we just go down this way so everybody gets a chance to speak? So to answer the first question, which was, I think it was about government services, of course you need it. I was going through a phase where I was just turned 20. I was in university, it was in my last term, like money was running out. I was lucky I had places, a place to stay. I, lucky I had friends that were helping me search things. And there is a thing called 
estrangement services in universities that do help with it. So when I went to my university's like social service and asked them for help, they had dealt with a case like this before. They'd known it existed, but that's not widespread. So we need more of that definitely. And I think what Council of Ex-Muslims are doing with the sort of shelter is amazing, like to have something like that to even turn to or exist. And then the last sort of question from the young girl who was trying to tie between the two. When I was thinking about this, I was gonna wait till I finish university. I had savings, I had that. I mean, if you don't have, if you're not in immediate danger and you don't have to sort of leave, don't, don't leave straight away, not until you're to have some sort of financial safety, not until you have someone outside, say like a friend or someone you can trust, because it's not worth putting your personal sort of safety at risk. Yeah, same on the last one. <laughs> uh, just take care of yourselves. See, you know, take, if it's possible. I mean, usually when you go through these kind of things, you're very young. Um, and um, if you can wait and make sure that you're secure, yeah, same. Um, why I insisted on my ex-husband to become circumcised? I, uh, yeah, the real reason behind it is this one. And I knew while I was thinking it, I thought, I cannot explain this, but this is what's real, what's truth. I had an attachment to my culture and I thought, um, I thought, suppose we get a boy, you know, we, we get a son. I don't know whether I want him to be circumcised or not. But what I don't want is suppose I get a son. And suppose, even though I don't believe in one way or another, I had attachment to my culture. Yeah, because I was like, oh, I'm getting Dutch, so Dutch, uh, you know. So I thought, but suppose I have a son and I want him to get, I realize, no, I feel it's, um, you know, I, I don't know why, but I have to, you know, he, he needs to be circumcised. Then I didn't want my son to be circumcised and not his father. Logic, no. This is just, you know, this is the truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then there was another... Yeah, what to say about that? I mean, it's horrible. It's also... There'll be other speakers that might yeah, answer that. So. Yeah. yeah, of course, it's also happening in, in, uh, uh, in, in Holland, but I hope and I think a little bit less because we are in Holland also very keen on um, girls leaving, uh, the countries they're leaving, in what, you know, people... The government is looking at um, risk families like, um, uh, yeah, they're keeping an eye on that. There was another thing I wanted to say, shit. Just we can come back to you, don't worry, because you're, you're our star, so you can, well, we're, you're all stars, but you're our yeah. special star. <laughs> so you've come from home. Um, to first address uh, Sahel's uh, comment that you made, um, I experienced the same thing, uh, because before I, I was completely disowned, I was in charge of my whole family. You know, many of my family members are dead. My mother's passed away. And it occurs to me, like, what would she think of the way that I am? And I can't, I can never find peace with that because I can never know. Um, and I will have frequent dreams about my siblings. I raised, I have five siblings. I'm the oldest. I raised them, you know. Um, so I completely relate to that experience and I wish that it was easier. So I, I completely understand that. Um, in terms of whether or not the government should set up um, systems for young people, is that what the question was? That's what yeah. Say, yeah. yeah, so I think the first thing to remember is that not every ex-Muslim is a young person, but that doesn't necessarily mean they don't need support. Um, because I've, I've spoken to ex-Muslims who you know, leave Islam when they're 30 and then they have no support at all. They don't know how to, like the, when I left, I didn't know how any of the world worked. I, I was completely left on my own, didn't know how public transport worked, how money worked, how anything worked. And then there are people who leave in their 30s and their 40s who need to get a job, ha suddenly have this giant gap, don't know what to do. 
Um, I will say that there is more support for young people as opposed to older people who might not know what to do. Um, as someone who works in education, I can say that we've dealt with several cases of girls being almost married off, girls being estranged, um, and then sending them to the right places. Um, be that if they're gay and they need support from Muslim LGBT um, things, or if they're ex-Muslim and they uh, or they just don't want to get married, you know. Um, and I think that that's important to remember is that um, our schooling systems have, you know, they have kind of become more secure for young people who are um, in some way in danger or are some way vulnerable. Um, so, yeah. Can I, can I say something? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The one thing though, first of all, I remembered what I wanted to say. The one thing I really think uh, um, and I don't see myself as a very radical person, but that's one thing I'm very passionate about is I don't understand, also in Holland this is happening, that um, girls who are, you know, four, five, six, we were speaking about that, and they're going to Islamic school and they wear a scarf, a hijab. I don't understand that that is not um, uh, against the law. I don't understand that that's not seen as child molestation. I don't understand. Okay, that's first. And the second thing um, about help with young people or at schools or whatever, what also breaks my heart is at one point you have family, you know, who is maybe shunning you or uh, trying to harm you or, uh, you know, saying they will harm you if you don't do what they want. And on the other side, you have people who want to help you, but... And I don't know how it is in UK, but in Holland, you become sort of like this pet project. Yeah. It's very colonialistic, you know. You are then the, wow, fantastic, you're leaving the bad Islam and da da da. No, I am, I am trying to become myself, my own, you know. I am nobody's wife, you know, I'm my own. So that's also one thing I think if there are people from the educational system or whatever, it, it, it's so bad. It needs to change. Yeah. Khadija? Um, can I just ask? Sure, the, go ahead. So the last question, I think there was two that were kind of in the same vein. Um, I'm in this situation. I don't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I will say is that if you are in a situation where you are in danger, get out. Because it's not, it's not worth it and it doesn't get better. Um, if you're in a situation where you are getting physically attacked, emotionally abused, it's not worth it for you to stay in that situation. Um, but if you have time and you can live with the restrictions, um, like for myself, I lived a double life for about a year with my uncle's family and I was able to find a job, get on my feet and things like that. Once you are financially stable is probably the best time for you to leave, but the fact that the fact that you even have to choose, which is what I thought your question was, like how do you get both? Um, I've only heard stories, un unless you look at Nazmiya's story, which is I feel like is the dream. Um, if if you come from a family like mine, who are quite uh, uptight and religious, um, I think the only way of going around that is seeing in future if those bonds are strengthened, and. To myself, what I've told myself is that it's not worth having people who don't accept you for you in your life. Mm. Um, I know that that's hard, and I know that that's heartbreaking. Believe me, I know. But if you cannot be yourself mm. with the people you love, you need to reassess if you're okay with that. Mm. Can, I, can I just... One more time. Sorry, sorry. Just, 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 just say that we only have 10 minutes left, so... I Very wanna, briefly. I want to get some comments here and also just do one last round of questions. Of course. I just wanted to say, um, uh, Adlet and I just made a, a, a new show, God is a Mother, and it's about uh, being shunned by our family, uh, uh, about being a mother, and about gay, homosexuality, transgender, LGBTIQ. And um, we spoke with 50 religious mothers and their kids who are religious or, you know, gay, all of them gay or LGBTIQ. But what I want to say is some of them, um, they cannot make amends with their mothers, but uh, uh, you never, you were never uh, born into your own community. You already had to find your own community as gay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have to 
make an effort to find your own community and you have to make an effort to find your own new family and if you need it you have to make an effort to you know ask uh, for a mother and um, yeah that's what I wanted to say Um, I would say, like, um, uh, in Pakistan, Ali asked uh, about uh, uh, what it has been for uh, women from Pakistan, Iran, or other Muslim-majority countries uh, as a feminist, or what, it's, uh, what is the st uh, situation uh, at the moment. Like, when I was young, nine, eight-year-old, my father brought colorful hijabs and he wanted me to wear it and I wore the, those hijabs excitedly because as a child it was uh, very excited for me to have colorful things and to match them with my clothes. But after a few days I felt suffocation because I wasn't allowed to take them off. I was told that you have to wear it whenever you go outside. And uh, I, I felt helpless. I felt like I have no one to turn to. And one day when I came back from my school, I saw my parents fighting, having furious arguments. And then my mother, she uh, came towards me and she pulled that hijab off my head and said to my father that I didn't give birth to a slave, which means like she is not going to wear it. And it's a sign of oppression. And my girl is not going to wear it anyway. My mother is not a liberal mother, I would say. She is still a conservative mother and um, conservative person, religious person. But what she did wasn't, uh, um, was all out of, I would say, unconditional love for a daughter because she didn't want me to suffer. She was suffering and she was unable to break her shackles but she didn't, didn't want me to suffer. She didn't want her other daughters to suffer. So this is the bonding we have with our family. And obviously it's, it's very difficult for any child to just even imagine that this bond can ever be broken. But when it is broken, then it's painful. I, I'm feeling really sorry for you, Sohail. It's, it's really heartbreaking to hear what you just said and for you, Faye, it's, it's not easy for any child, and no child deserves this. Parents don't, should not treat their kids as slaves or as some kind of property. They are your children, and you have responsibility towards them, and they owe nothing to you in return. They are individuals, your beliefs, your traditions, your, uh, you know. You should not uh, make everything uh, about a kind of, uh, um, you know, satisfaction for your own false pride and false uh, superior cultural or religious superiority. It's, it should be about your kids and the unconditional love that you can give to your child. Thank you. Thank you, Shabhan. Um, I just want to address the, um, uh, the issue that it's not only about being born free or what young people go through. We had a case where um, uh, older person, he got cancer and he was at his death bath and the whole, and, and he don't wanted a religious funeral. Uh, and the pressure he was exposed to by the whole family, it was heartbreaking. Uh, you, uh, someone here said that, you know, you get handicapped by your beliefs. And it, I think that was what we were witnessing because they really didn't take in that it was this man's last wish because they were so afraid of what people will say or they will be shunned. Or, so they demanded and demanded the religious funeral. And, you know, the, the sad thing is that he just agreed because he saw their pain. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, I'm going to die anyway. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, I hope his story will came out in one or another way because what he went through, it was really, really sad. So it follows us, you know, the control into the death and after that as well. I want to answer your question. You said you saw the mother as a victim as well. 
it's a, it's a belief that we need. It's almost like women are damned if they're damned in both ways. Women are not um, victims, hopeless victims and helpless that they just static there. Um, women actually do participate in perpetrating a lot of the violences. They do have the agency. They have the agency to make a choice as to whether they want to help their daughters because we have seen many cases where women will protect their daughters in order not to go through what they have gone through, such as, for example, in a lot of cases of FGM. There are also women who would actually be more, more active in punishing any behavior that a girl has um, done in order to restore honor in the community. And we have seen in the news, sorry. sorry, the, uh, ahead, sorry. Uh, and we have seen uh, quite a few cases in the news where the mothers have been prosecuted uh, as being the main mastermind behind the killing. Uh, circumcision, male circumcision is very different to female mm -hmm. FGM. Both are wrong. Uh, and let's not forget, it involves an adult touching the genitalia of a child. If that is not child sexual abuse, I don't know what is child sexual abuse. Uh, it is mutilated. For the boys, it's very different later on because they do not have the same consequences that it has on a female. Female, she's affected sexually, and sexuality is very important for any human being. It is the one thing that plays a key role in our mental health and the way that we function in our daily life. There is nothing more important than that aspect of a human. And uh, we do see a lot about FGM in the news recently because it's, it has become a mandatory uh, reporting. So if anybody is aware of somebody that is about to be cut or somebody who has been cut, that, that has to be reported. And there is also a lot of new legislations in protecting victims of forced marriage, of um, forced marriage, FGM. FGM, sorry. And one more key thing, uh, you mentioned family estrangement services. If you ever go see a therapist and they do approach your uh, their work as being that of family estrangement, please make them aware that it is not family estrangement. Family estrangement involves one person of the family, not the whole community and the whole family. And the work that they would do psychologically will be very different uh, uh, fr uh, from one to another. I'm sorry, uh, Nahla says we have to end. I just want to thank uh, these wonderful women. We have a... Um, uh, some time to um, drink and network afterwards so we can talk to them uh, some more. Uh, again, thank you so much, Saf, Nazmia, Faye, Khadija, Shabana, and Savin. I, I do want to say that, uh, as you said, Shawan, this is not just an issue for women, but it's International Women's Day, so we're focusing on the issue of women. We're going to do that again around gay pride and the shunning of um, LGBT and uh, uh, the International Ex-Muslim uh, Coalition is campaigning against shunning throughout this year. So we're going to be trying to raise awareness on this to say there's nothing wrong with being different, thinking differently, loving who you want, living how you want. And it's actually shunning that should be shunned, basically, and that should be, uh, you know, um, uh, completely kicked out of our lives and our communities and our families. So thank you again, and uh, I'll leave you to Nahla. Thank, thank you. you.